I'm David Pittman, pastor of the Addiston Baptist Church in Addiston, Ohio, and I'd like to read a book review that I prepared on why I preach from the received text. Editors Jeffrey Riddle and Christian McShaffrey in 2022 gave us a book bearing the title of my essay. It's an anthology of essays by a variety of Reformed ministers in defense of the traditional Protestant text of the New Testament, a view best reflecting confessional bibliology. I found the book a fascinating, forceful volume with the essayist styles blending theological, biographical, devotional, and logical arguments for retaining the mature editions of the Texas Receptus as the basis for translation into any language. I was encouraged to see this issue, revis issue revisited with such clarity and charity nearly 40 years after I first encountered this discussion. When I graduated in 1978, I was awarded in recognition of excellence in Greek studies a Greek New Testament by the Trinitarian Bible Society. Upon investigation, I found an affinity with the society and have maintained a membership from then till now. I would like to add my voice to those of the essayists who preach from the received text. I do so because I think collectively they present a wise path navigating between the dangers of Ruckmanism on the one hand and the dangers of rationalism on the other. I'm aware that my view will anger both extremes, anger being the one thing the extremists on both sides have in common. I find three bases for preaching from the received text and three benefits. I preach from the received text for the following reasons. Number one, confessional reasons. The Old Testament in Hebrew, which was the native language of the people of God of old, and the New Testament in Greek, which at the time of the writing of it was most generally known to the nations, being immediately inspired by God and by his singular care and providence kept pure in all ages, are therefore authentic, so as in all controversies of religion the church is finally to appeal to them. But because these original tongues are not known to all the people of God who have a right unto an interest in the scriptures and are commanded in the fear of God to read and search them, therefore they are to be translated into the vulgar language of every nation unto which they come, that the word of God dwelling plentifully in all they may worship him in an acceptable manner and through patience and comfort of the scriptures may have hope. So reads the Second London Confession, chapter 1, paragraph 8. In every paragraph in the 1689 Confession, the Bible is presented in the present tense. The scriptures are, they are contained in the 66 books so named. The Confession speaks of a Bible given, received, and preserved. I find this in the First London as well which reads the Holy Scriptures in which is plainly recorded. The New Hampshire Confession echoes this. They said, We believe that the Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is a perfect treasure of heavenly instruction, that it has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter, that it reveals the principles by which God will judge us and therefore is, and shall remain to the end of the world the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and opinions should be tried. These confessions assume preservation of the text with maximum certainty as to its very words. A second reason, canonical reasons. I find the canonical approach to the words as well as to the books of the Bible, to be a compelling argument. I first encountered this type of approach in Theodore Lettuce, the ecclesiastical text, he called it. His approach, with refinements predicated by my Baptist perspective and polity, resonated with me. I studied critical text theory and became conversant with the use of a textual apparatus, but I found the vagaries of shifting standards unwise. 
when changes could be made between editions of the critical text without any change in manuscript evidence, and the text could be manipulated by guesses and intuition, there is no final standard. A third reason is convictional reason. When Billy Graham's fellow evangelist, Charles Chuck Templeton, departed from the faith and eventually became an atheist, he implored Graham to pursue the same path. Graham experienced a crisis of faith, but it resolved differently. Billy Graham would later recount, quote, So I went back and got my Bible, and I went out in the moonlight. And I got to a stump and put the Bible on the stump, and I knelt down and I said, Oh God, I cannot prove certain things. I cannot answer some of the questions Chuck is raising and some of the other people are raising. But I accept this book by faith as the Word of God. Unquote. It's recorded in the Billy Graham story by John Pollock, published by Zondervan, 2003. It's page 44. In 1984, as I was completing seminary, bombarded on the left by critical text radicals and on the right by Ruckmanites, I poured out my soul in prayer and committed my ministry to preaching from the received text. I found what Dr. Edward Hills called the logic of faith and maximum certainty. I was told 40 years ago that my view was soon to be marginalized as to be completely forgotten. I was told that translations based on the received text would be abandoned. I was also told that the critical text would soon be so sure and settled as to variance as to end all uncertainty. Now some critical text advocates are admitting that the pursuit of the original text is impossible and unimportant. And the Texas Receptus still stands, much to the aggravation of its detractors and more to the appreciation of its defenders. I find three benefits in preaching from the received text. Number one, personal. My Bible reading and personal devotions are not distracted by variance and uncertainties about what the text is. I focus on what the text says. I can consult dictionaries, grammars, and translations about what the text means in my native language, but the underlying text is inviolate. The Bible tells me what to believe and how to behave. It judges me, it sanctifies me, it comforts me, and its author, the Holy Spirit, bears witness with my spirit. Number two, I find pastoral benefits in preaching from the received text. My pulpit pre preparation requires little time with a textual apparatus or agonizing over variance. It still takes time reading, study and prayer and time. But pastoral counseling is also unhindered by anxiety over the text. I can invest my time in teaching God's inspired, inerrant, infallible, and sufficient word. The third practical reason my wider ministry of academic and apologetic pursuits, my investment in world missions, including Bible translation and distribution, are all firmly based on the confessional, canonical, convictional confidence with which I am blessed to know the Word of God. I am deeply indebted to the editors and essayists of Why I Preach from the Received Text. I echo their conclusions and their conviction, convictions. And I close with the Holy Spirit's words through the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God. In the sight of God speak we in Christ.